Uh, thank you very much. Um, today, I want to talk about some of my new data about repetitive DNA. And um, um, uh, repetitive DNA can generally be divided into tandem repeats and dispersed uh, repeats. Um, tandem repeats are satellites like micro mini satellites and microsatellites. And DNA repeats are uh, stability is important because the failure of maintaining a constant number of repeats can result in many neurological diseases like fragile X syndrome, Huntington's disease, and free trade attacks. Uh, repetitive DNA makes up a huge percentage of our genome. It is estimated that 66 to 69% of the human genome is repetitive DNA. Uh, and in the worms, the elegans, uh, the amount of repetitive DNA is much smaller. Uh, it is only a 12 to 16 percent of uh, repetitive DNA. Uh, therefore, worms must have some mechanism that protects them from the expansion of repetitive elements. We, we wanted to investigate uh, repetitive sequences and the elegance by analyzing RNA expression by analyzing RNA expression from multi-copy transgenes. And uh, before the CRISPR era, uh, mutants were generally created by injecting a plasmid, which contains a gene of interest. In, into the germline. And this plasmid will then assemble into a multi copy extra chromosomal array that can then be integrated into the chromosome using ionizing radiation. Uh, and one example of that can, uh, is this uh, ANG47 promoter driven GFP uh, that drives GFP expression in the GABA ergic neurons. So by analyzing RNA expression from these uh, GABA ergic neurons, we could see um, that uh, the RNA expression coming from the GABAergic GABA neurons co-localized with the GFP protein expression as we expected. However, we could also see a prominent amount of uh, RNA expression, GFP RNA expression coming from the germline that did not co-localize with any amount of GFP protein expression, um, which was interesting to us and indicated that the, this GFP RNA was probably silenced and, and not uh, translated. Therefore, we wanted to know if the silencing uh, was dependent on uh, small RNAs, and second, if also this could be a general uh, mechanism for uh, endogenous repetitive sequences. Uh, the small RNA pathway uh, that is necessary uh, is necessary to regulate gene expression, and as soon as an RNA is um, transcribed in the nucleus and exported, it will land in, in a structure that is called the germ tank. It will then be scanned by different argonaut proteins like uh, PRG1 and uh, CSR1 that bind to uh, small RNAs and will decide if the RNA gets translated or silenced. If the RNA is silenced, it will go into a substructure of the germ granule, which is called the mutator body. Uh, where uh, small RNAs will be transcribed uh, from the template that will then be imported again uh, into the nucleus by another argonaut protein and bind to the nascent uh, RNA transcript, uh, which will then uh, recruit a different uh, chromatin modifiers that will uh, lead um, to uh, different chromatin modifications and uh, genomic uh, silencing and also the degradation of, of the nascent RNA. I also wanted to point out uh, that inside the mutator body, um, the small RNAs tra are transcribed uh, from a template uh, that has a polyrigid tail, which is called a, a tuck RNA. And um, this um, template recruits an RDRP that will then uh, transcribe uh, small RNAs uh, from, from this template, uh, which are then uh, necessary for the silencing process. So in order to see if uh, this um, pathway played a role in the silencing of this um, GFP RNA in, in the germline, uh, we looked at the co-localization of um, PAC RNAs together with the GFP RNA in the germline, and we found that there was almost a perfect uh, co-localization in many instances, in, in, uh, indicating that uh, this PAC RNA pathway was a part of this um, GFP uh, uh, silencing uh, pathway. And um, so we then also wanted to know if this was the case for other multi-copy transgenes, and we could uh, see um, similar phenomena uh, for two other um, multi-copy transgenes. And interestingly, we could also see that the abundance of the GFP uh, uh, RNA transcript uh, coincided with the uh, correlated with the abundance of the DNA copy number 
of, of the specific and also of the transgene, indicating the RNA transport number was dependent on the DNA uh, copy number. Uh, next, we wanted to investigate if this phenomenon uh, was further um, um, dependent on small RNA pathways uh, by uh, looking at two player, uh, key players of small RNA pathways. Uh, as I already pointed out, um, RD3, um, which is necessary uh, for small RNA um, transcription, and also NERD2, uh, which is necessary for the recruitment of uh, chromatin modifications. Um, but then, uh, small RNA sequencing, uh, we could see um, that, as we expected, that there was a lot of antisense small RNAs that localized to the GFP uh, part of the uh, plasmid backbone sequence. Um, however, to our surprise, um, we could see that there was also an abundant amount of other uh, antisense small RNAs that would cover um, the rest of the plasmid backbone. And we could also see that there was a, um, the sense of small RNAs uh, covered, um, covered the entire plasmid backbone, which was an unexpected, um, a surprising finding to us. This is also the case uh, when we looked at the nerdy 2 mutants, where we could see um, small RNAs again, uh, covering the entire plasmid backbone in the sense and antisense direction, even though there was a lower abundance uh, compared to wild type. And our control um, was the RD3 mutant, where we did not see any uh, small RNAs um, covering uh, the um, plasmid backbone, indicating that these RNAs, uh, small RNAs, were RD3 dependent, um, that they were both uh, generated in the sense and antisense direction, and that's also we, there would be templates necessary uh, for the generation of these small RNAs um, that would also be transcribed uh, from the entire plasma spectrum. Uh, so our initial hypothesis, where we saw that the promoter would be necessary to transcribe um, this uh, transcript, seemed to be wrong. And our new hypothesis was that transcripts could be generated over the entire plasma backbone coming from the sense and antisense direction. So in order to confirm our hypothesis, um, we did RNA fishing. And we again looked at the late uh, part of the zone of the germline, where most of these um, transcripts were expressed. Uh, and the following pictures in, in the close-up, you will see um, usually two prominent dots inside the nuclei, which uh, correspond to the transcription sites. And when we looked at the, the GFP RNA um, sense expression, we could again see um, that in the nearly two and RD3 mutant, the GFP sense RNA was um, expressed and was at a higher abundance uh, in the nearly two mutants, um, which uh, lacked many of the histone modifications. And uh, it was also expressed in the RD3 mutant, which lacked um, small RNAs. So when, when we looked at um, RNAs coming uh, from the undersense direction of the GFP, we could also see them expressed. Uh, again, in the wild type background, as well as in the nd 2 and, and RD3 mutant, uh, indicating um, that the sense and antisense direction of the GFP were expressed. And this was also true when we looked at the ampicillin resistance screen um, coming from the plasma backbone, which lacked um, a C. elegans promoter. And again, it, it showed an um, expression um, for the wild type background in nd 2 and RD3 mutant. Uh, we were then wondering if um, this was something that was just happening in, in, this trans, in these transgenes, or if this could also be a mechanism happening in, in the endogenous repeats. Uh, so we looked at different endogenous sequences uh, present in the C. elegans genome, and one of them was uh, well, telomere repeats. So as you probably know, um, telomere repeats um, cover the antichromosome arms um, to protect them. And then the elegans, they are usually two to nine kilobases in length, and they consist of the sequence TPAGBC. And so by, by looking at telomere um, RNA, we could again see that it was expressed in, in the Parkinson zone, and it was also, was also dependent on the NERD2 um, pathway, uh, so indicating um, that this expression also depended on, on small RNAs. And we found a similar transcription pattern for a gene called ZC247.1, which has 47 copies in the genome, another gene called N1, which is present in five copies, and the satellite repeat, which is present in 15 copies per chromosome. 
So we were just, so I'm wondering what are these um, small RNAs for and why do they need to uh, protect these repetitive sequences? Uh, so we were wondering if maybe they could um, change a copy number in, inside for, for these repeats. And so we evaluated a GFP copy number uh, for the transgene and the wild background and in, in the small RNA mutants. And we found uh, that the copy number was significantly reduced in the small RNA mutants, indicating that small RNAs were necessary to maintain um, copy number for, for this repetitive for this repetitive DNA. So this leads us um, to our um, model. Uh, where we have small RNAs um, that induce histone modifications and then will lead to adequate transcription of uh, repetitive DNA, which then again can be used as a template to generate small RNAs that will then um, continue in, in the circle. And when we look at the multitudinous end, we lose some of these histone modifications, which will then lead to some form of DNA damage that will force the contraction of these repetitive sequences and uh, the um, and repeat instability occurs. So when when we then look at the RD3 mutant, we lose uh, small RNAs and also some of the uh, corresponding uh, chromatin modifications, which will also then lead to DNA damage and again to a contraction of this uh, repetitive DNA and uh, genome instability. So we this is our our working model, and we still have a couple of questions that we want to answer. And so, for example, we want to know what exactly are these chromatin modifications of these repeats um, during Parkinson? Uh, what role ex does transcription play um, during this process? And we would also like to know uh, which uh, endogenous repeats are, are targeted by the damage in, in the absence of, of small RNA pathways. And so, um, with that, I would like to. Um, thank my lab, um, which helped me a lot with the preparation of, of this talk and, and experiments, and especially my supervisor, uh, Craig Mello, for his continuous support, and also um, our different uh, funding sources, and you for your attention. So. Thank you very much. Again, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, and while we're waiting for those, I'll start with a question if I may. Um, so my question, I might have missed it and I apologize if I did, but could you talk a bit more about the mechanism by which small RNAs uh, maintain large copy repeats? Is that purely through epigenetic mechanisms or do you think, um, how does that process of ma maintaining large uh, repeat regions happen? Um, yes, yeah, so, so we can only speculate. We, we don't exactly mm -hmm. know the mechanism right now. But, but one uh, possibility would be that there's um if if there's if if they if you lose some of these chromatin modifications that would usually induce heterochromatin in these regions, um we uh, during a DNA replication or transcription we would have like some R loop formation for example, which would then induce uh, some form of DNA damage and by DNA repair mechanisms. Uh, we would then, through recombination, lose some of these uh, copies of, of, of the um, repetitive DNA. So, so that, that could be one possibility. And I'm sure that there's um, some other possibilities as well. But um, it, it, is, it seems to be clear also from um, research in other model organisms that repetitive DNA are very much also is, needs um, heterochromatin also to, to be maintained. Thank you. And sort of on the flip side of that, are small RNAs required to enlarge repetitive regions? How does the mechanism of increasing repeats occur? Oh, the mechanism of increasing repeats? Um, yeah, I think, I think this, this would also could, could happen through a similar mechanism. For example, we could imagine like a rolling circle um, insertion, for example. So, so if, um, during a replication, uh, we would have some extra chromosomal DNA that would form. And that could then integrate um, into into that region or through DNA repair processes. Maybe, maybe it could also enlarge these repeats, and, and that could, could happen through a similar mechanism. So, so while while I mostly saw uh, like a reduction of of repeats during mm -hmm. these processes, this this was um, this is like a statistical analysis. So, so when we look at individual worms, there might also be some which have like uh, an enlargement of repeats. It's just sure. like a smaller amount of 
focus on analysis. Thank you. And a question about your, your plasmid assay, where you have the sort of sense and anti-sense transcripts simultaneously. Um, yeah. Do you think that's uh, specific to the, a, a plasmid? Or is that also going to happen in the genome that has sort of chromatin uh, regulation as well? Um, so I think it's, it can also, it, um, so we're currently in the process of, of analyzing data. So we, 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 for example, now that for the telomeric repeats, we, we saw that, that there is also um, antisense uh, telomeric repeats uh, mm -hmm. that we can, can see in this, um, in, in this process. Uh, we did not see antisense um, transcription from all of the genes um, that I analyzed in this process. So I, I think it, it very much depends on, on the type of repeat. And then also, um, I, yeah, I, I think I think we still need um, more more data to to really um, con confirm how it happens. But but it could also be that, for example, through the process of recombination, that there would be um, like some and DNA structure coming um, that, that, that would be in sense and anti-sense direction, but on the same strand that, that could be transcribed and, and leading to this uh, type of um, uh, uh, small RNAs. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from the audience. And the question is, what's your plan for identifying the chromatin modifications involved in the in the maintenance of uh, repeat regions? Um, so yeah, so so there's um, different approaches. So one possibility is uh, obviously in the past, there have been several publications where we could just do um, just uh, do some antibody staining with uh, some uh, uh, some H three K nine dimethylation or trimethylation, for example. And uh, because of these um, the repetitive structure of, of these um, integrated chromosomal arrays, sometimes they are they are so um, large that you can just see them by H three K nine trimethylation. There's also assays uh, where you can isolate these repeat uh, structures uh, by um, just um, fishing out mm -hmm. um, this repetitive DNA and then do doing mass spectrometry on, on the proteins that are cross-linked to this uh, repetitive DNA. And by that, we, we would be able to find all the proteins associated with them. 